In the summer of 1899, the newsboys of New York City went on strike against newspaper giants Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Child labor at this time was not only common, but limitlessly available for children and essential for booming cities. New York and other cities near major waterways, such as the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean, experienced a population boom in the late 19th century due to immigration. Susan Campbell Bartoletti notes in her book Kids on Strike that by 1870, the population of New York City was growing by 50% every 10 years. In this era, where the Industrial Revolution caused changes in production, many families struggled and needed the additional income their children could provide. Because of this struggle, some children ran away from their homes in hopes to ease the burden of their parents. In many of these cases, the parents were either relieved that they had one less mouth to feed or unworried because they believed the child, most often a boy, would return eventually for food. Whether they were enrolled in school, had homes and families to return to at the end of the day, or were, or were runaways, kids spent a substantial amount of time in the streets of their cities. Some played games and looked after their siblings, and others, like Newsies and Messenger Boys, worked. Many youth-organized gangs formed from this time spent on the street as a way to form friendships, protect one another, and steal food and clothes wherever they could. The streets were a mode of transportation and communication, a playground, and a workplace for children. The selling and distribution of papers was, according to Bartoletti, the most common job for city kids. Of these newsies, the majority, majority of them were boys, ranging from as young as 8 years old to 15 years old. There were some newsgirls, as we will discuss later in this lecture, but boys really dominated this form of child labor. In order to be successful at this job, a newsie was required to be aware and considerate of many factors such as day and time, weather, um, the season, and sports scores, which could all make or break a newsie's sales. However, while all of these aspects impacted the newsie's amount of papers purchased for distribution, the most impactful detail regarding sales was the headline. If the headline was weak, sales were weak. Therefore, newsies developed various marketing strategies in order to sell their papers because unsold papers would not be bought back. These strategies included physical pushing and elbowing through crowds, hawking false, completely fictitious headlines that could actually grab people's attention and curiosity. Another crafty strategy was playing on the sympathy of passerbys with a crutch or tears. While these working conditions and way of life may not sound appealing, especially from a 21st century perspective, none of these factors were the direct cause for the newsboy strike. During April of 1898, the Spanish-American War began, causing the strike or causing a spike in headlines and a want of newspapers from the American public. David Nassau points out in the art the American Heritage article, Dirty Face David and the Twin Goliaths, that Pulitzer and Hearst, our twin Goliaths, raised their prices during the height of this war, which lasted from April to August of 1898. It was actually this price rage, or price rage, that enraged the Newsies um, a year later when they decided to boycott in 1899. So, let's break this down from the newsboy perspective. Prior to this price raise, the Newsies would buy newspapers at a wholesale price of 50 cents for 100 papers, or one paper for two cents. The Newsies would then go out and sell papers at a retail price of one cent, one whole penny. These pennies collected from sales is what the Newsies would pocket as, they pay f as a pay for their labor. If they had a home and parents to return to at the end of the day, these pennies would go to their parents, who often gave a small bit back, but the majority went to your standard of living. Um, other newsies who were classified as street waifs, um, which meant they were runaways and lived on the streets, would obviously keep their earnings to live on. If a newsie had unsold papers at the end of the day, they were simply out of luck. Papers were not refunded or repurchased by the distributing press. In the midst of a nation at war, papers were selling like hotcakes due to public concern and a strong, compelling headline. Because of this, Pulitzer and Hearst raised their wholesale price by 10 cents in order to boost their circulation. This meant that at 60 cents per 100 papers, the Newsies would have to sell more papers in order to obtain their usual earnings because the retail price of a paper 
remained one cent, so the public consumer was not deterred from purchasing a paper. As long as it was seemingly easy to sell papers with a captivating headline, the newsies weren't upset. However, as David Nassau notes, by the summer of 1899, quote, news grew tamer and the headlines shrank. Newsies began to feel the pinch of the penny increase, and by now it was apparent that the temporary increase would become a permanent one unless they did something about it. This was the true cause of the strike. The Newsies wanted the prices to be set back so they could continue to make their usual earnings. While the cause of the strike is clear, determining when exactly the strike began is a little less clear. So Nassau points out that the first action against the distribution of papers um, sold at 60 cents per 100 occurred in Long Island because a delivery man for the journal was shorting newsies of papers they paid full price for. So for example, they ordered a hundred or they asked for a hundred papers and paid their full 60 cents, but they were only given 50. Um, now that's just an example. I don't know how much he was shorting them, but clearly the newsies were upset. He could have given them 99. But the extra two cents that were spent were valuable to the newsie, and he wanted that paper so he could sell it. Um, because of this shorting of papers by this particular delivery man, the Long Island newsies were outraged and chased the delivery man out of town after flipping his delivery wagon and stealing the papers. This event took place on July 18th. On the following day, July 19th, the Newsies in Manhattan organized a union that would strike the following day, July 20th, unless the prices were reduced to the original 50 cents per 100 papers. A combination of these two tactics that we see, you know, forming right at the beginning um, of action, usually violent action, and communication, such as the organization of meetings to form a union, were the leading forces that shaped the strike. For two weeks, Newsies took to, to the streets without spreading headlines or carrying newspapers. Instead, they scouted out Newsies who were still distributing papers for the Journal in the World, who were known as scabs, and they would soak them, meaning they would um, beat them up, for lack of a better phrase, um, and destroy the papers they were attempting to sell in order to further limit Pulitzer and her circulation. In addition to soaking scabs, the Newsies daily took to flipping over delivery wagons and tearing the newspapers to shreds. The boys were not solely violently active in distributing their me message, though. An article in the New York Times, which was published on July 22, 1899, titled The Strike of the Newsboys, reported that the Newsies wore messages on their hats and clothes that read, quote, please don't buy the evening journal and world because the newsboys has striked, end quote, or quote, I ain't a scab, end quote. This act of communication was paired with larger versions of more significance as well. Um, Nassau claims that the newsies were in, quote, constant communication um, as, quote, the strike committee sent representatives to the outlying regions and the outer suburbs elected delegates to travel down to Park Row. They had a really intricate form of um, communicating with each other, which was further aided by other newspapers who were thrilled to see Pulitzer and Hearst being antagonized, even by children, and supported the Newsies mainly for their own amusement, but also with the hope that their newspaper circulation would rise. Um, papers that participated in this way um, were The Sun, The New York Times, um, and many others. Um, they specifically were helpful because they published interviews with Newsies from other districts, which would be read and thus communicated to other boycotting Newsies. Um, we've talked about how there were um, obviously Newsies in Manhattan and Long Island, but this Really, the strike really did reach further than expected, especially when considered in the time frame. The strike only lasted two weeks, um, but even cities in other states like New Jersey were affected, Brooklyn, 
basically any small district in New York that you can think of was involved. Um, it really was quite the event. Um, so an employee of Pulitzer even went so far as to declare that the Newsies won over the public because the public was encouraging and tipping them or they were just simply refusing to buy papers out of fear of the Newsies. On the night of July 24th, the Newsboys Union organized a meeting at the New Irving Hall on Broom Street. About 5,000 Newsies were in attendance, but 3,000 were forced to stand out on the street because the hall was overfilled with Newsies waiting to hear the speeches that were to be made. The New York Times covered the meeting in an article titled, Newsboys Act and Talk, Fight and Champion Their Cause in Mass Meeting. In this article, the reporter asserts that the political adult figures um, were present at this meeting as well. Um, one of these was an ex-assemblyman named Philip Wissig, who spoke to the Newsies saying, quote, You are only the rising generation, and if the older ones can't support you, they can at least treat you fairly. Now keep up the fight. Don't violate the law. Don't use dynamite. But stick together, and you'll win. End quote. The article published in the New York Times not only documents the happenings of this event, but it also gives us an understanding of who the Newsies leading the strike were. One Newsie, known as Bob Indian, shared the, with the listeners that a committee of Newsies went to speak to Mr. Hurst, um, who claimed that he couldn't afford to sell the paper for the price of 50 cents because he would lose $100,000 a year. As you can imagine, the Newsies found this laughable. They're asking for pennies, but are denied because of hundreds of thousands. Other Newsies took to the stand as well to speak, such as Racetrack Higgins, Nick Myers, and most importantly, Kid Blink. Kid Blink may be the most remembered Newsie from the strike and is commonly recognized as a leader, although this isn't completely accurate. However, Kid Blink did stand to speak and his speech was well received. Known by the name Kid Blink for his small stature and eye patch worn over one eye, he told the Newsies, quote, I don't agree with you boys about going up and taking papers away from people. What we want is to stick together and not see the journal in the world. End quote. He goes on to admit that although he has also been one of the Newsies who hits the drivers of the wagons and dumps carts, he doesn't think it's right. However, his most memorable line was, quote, 10 cents in the dollar is as much to us as it is to Mr. Hurst, the millionaire. We can do more with 10 cents than he can with 25, end quote. Following the completion of the speeches, Joe Kiernan was placed at the chairman's table and sang a patriotic song to close the meeting. Regarding women involved in the strike, there were some but not many. In general, young girls did not have the street jobs because, as Bartoletti points out, adults wanted to shield girls from street dangers and believed not much could be learned on the streets that would prepare them for marriage. Nevertheless, there were some girl newsies who continued to sell papers despite the strike, so I guess we can't really think of them as supporters. There are two supporters that are mentioned and who speak at the new Irving Hall um, meeting. But even the report doesn't give them as much attention as the boy speakers. Um, and one of them is, I hope, affectionately nicknamed Crazy Auburn. Anyways, um, some of the girls who did continue to sell papers weren't treated the same way other boys who continued to sell papers were seen. Um, unlike the male scabs, the girls could continue selling papers without being harmed by boycotting newsies. In the aforementioned New York Times article, The Strike of the New Newsboys, published on July 22nd, the reporter writes that women moved about, quote, unmolested through the line of strikers, end quote, offering papers for sale. This scene offered, as the reporter put it, in, put it, an 
quote, unexpected insight into the chivalry that evidently enters into the makeup of the newsboys, end quote. In addition to the few female newsies selling papers, it is reported that at the Irving Hall meeting, two women reporters were in attendance. After two weeks of continued striking, which is uh, which still included the acts of violence on scabs and delivery carts, even though some people like Kid Blink said, you know, we need to stick together and not be violent. The Newsies still held true to their prior form. Um, but regardless, the publishers ultimately came to a compromising conclusion that would satisfy the Newsies so their circulation could improve. Um, rather than roll back the price from 60 cents to 50 cents per 100 papers, Pulitzer and Hearst kept the 60 cent price, but they agreed to buy back unsold papers at the end of each workday. Therefore, while the Newsies would still spend an unwelcome price on the papers, if their sales weren't as high as they hoped, they could receive a 100% refund on the leftover papers. On August 2nd, 1899, the Newsies began selling the world in the journal once again. Pictured here are the leaders of the Newsboys' opposition, Joseph Pulitzer of the New York World and William Randolph Hearst of the Journal. As the caption in this photo indicates, which was extracted from Bartoletti's book, Pulitzer is widely remembered in American society. Most people could probably associate his name with a Pulitzer Prize, even if they don't know what the prize awards. Many um, are unaware that this newspaper giant, seemingly one of the most powerful men in New York time at the turn of the century, was, as Nassau describes, quote, nearly blind, suffering from bouts of depression and so sensitive to sound, he exploded when, he, when the silverware was rattled. He managed his newspapers in absentia for the last 20 years of his life, end quote. Because of these issues, Pulitzer was informed on the happenings of the world, in terms of the real world, but also his newspaper, by memos. It was in this way Pulitzer was informed of the strike and its effect from Don Seitz. The first memo read that the paper distribution, quote, had some trouble today, through the strike on the part of the newsboys, end quote. In the next memo, delivered on July 22nd, it was titled, On the Newsboys Strike, and its contents claimed that the strike would most likely be sporadic, but the situation was under control. This was not the case, however, because one day later, the tone completely changed. See, it's wrote, quote, The newsboys strike has grown into a menacing affair. It is proving a serious problem. Practically all the boys in New York and adjacent towns have quit selling, end quote. By the 24th, the day that the newsboys organized their meeting, Seitz was in awe of the newsies and their strike, writing to Pulitzer that, quote, the advertisers have abandoned the papers and sale has been cut down fully by two-fifths. It is proving a serious problem. Practically all the boys in New York... <laughs> Oops... Um, sorry, I lost my spot. So the advertisers, advertisers have abandoned the papers and the sale has been cut down fully by two fists. It is really a very extraordinary demonstration. This is representative of an adult's awe to the fact that this gang of boys um, could really cause this much damage to one of the biggest newspapers in the city. Um, the most, most striking of the memos, however, um, took place toward the end of the strike when defeat was upon Pulitzer. See, it's claimed that the, quote, loss of circul circulation has been colossal, end quote. Nassau breaks down in his article just how colossal the effects really were by writing, the press run had been reduced from over 360,000 to 125,000, while returns more than doubled from the customary 15 or 16 percent to an average of 35 percent. A compromise was reached, as previously mentioned, in the price um, in which the price remained the same, but full refunds were offered for the Newsies unsold papers. So, 
why do we only know Pulitzer for the Pulitzer Prize, which honors artistic achievements? Why don't we know about the person who suffered from personal and health issues that kept him unable to work? Why don't we blacklist his name due to his role in exploiting child labor? His legacy is that of success, a real success without compromise. We remember him in this way because he has the American dream that we strive to achieve. What we don't see in Pulitzer's luminous legacy is the little guys who are on the sidelines, or literally the streets in this case, making his success possible. The Newsies' American dream was one of survival, of just getting by, but they couldn't achieve it and literally had to fight for it in order to be given a compromise. Pulitzer's dream was of unregulated one, regardless of who was struggling at the bottom as long as he was on top.